Greetings, church history friends, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Peter Smith, and tonight I will serve as your host for our fourth lecture in the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation's Autumn Lecture Series. We greatly appreciate you joining us this evening as we continue to explore Community of Christ history around the world. In tonight's program, we will hear about church history in the Holy Land from Barb Walden. Now, it's an annual tradition for the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation to take to the road to explore church history on a bus tour every autumn. In fact, this time last year, we were exploring church history in the Holy Land on a two and a half week tour of Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and Egypt. Some of you tonight may have been on that tour with Barb and I, and this lecture might feel like uh, feel a bit nostalgic as you heard many of the stories and saw a number of the historic places that will be mentioned in tonight's program. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we will not be traveling this year, choosing rather to stay home for everyone's safety. And some could say we are keeping with a long held tradition within our faith community's history of reorganizing and changing plans when needed. Instead of boarding a motor coach this year, we will travel the world through the pages of church history. Thank you all for staying home, staying safe, and tuning in this evening. I'm not alone this evening hosting the program as Megan Reed is joining me tonight as co-host. Megan Reed has been a steady co-host throughout both the summer and autumn lecture series. Megan is working on her master's degree at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. She's also serving as a student intern in the Elma Blair Internship Program, a young adult program at the historic sites made possible thanks to your generous donations. Thank you for serving as co-host tonight and every night, Megan. Our autumn lecture series is not only a great way to spend the evening learning church history, it's also a benefit for the Community of Christ Historic Sites. You see, the sites are temporarily closed for, the pub, for public safety due to COVID-19. However, the preservation and maintenance needs of the historic properties continues on, and your donations are especially critical this year as the loss of revenue from site preservation fees and mu museum store sales in 2020 is unprecedented as we continue to work toward the goal of becoming self-sustaining, your donations from tonight's lecture will go a long way toward supporting and preserving Community of Christ historic sites for future generations. For those who like to make an online donation, Megan has dropped the donation link in the chat box just now. You are also welcome to send a donation in the mail to the address found in the chat box as well. Thank you for helping preserve church heritage. Now, the last person I want to introduce you tonight uh, to tonight, uh, it needs no introduction actually. Our guest speaker is Barbara Walton, who is the Executive Director of the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation, a position she has held for nearly 10 years. She is the former Site Director of the Kirtland Temple and past president of the John Whitmer Historical Association. In addition to her responsibilities at the Historic Sites Foundation, Barb also serves as one of three official church historians for Community of Christ and as a faculty, a faculty member at the Community of Christ Seminary. Welcome, Barb, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'll turn the microphone over to you as we are all ready to hear about church history in the Holy Land. Uh, thank you, Peter. It's a joy to be with you, and I was excited to see there's 140 people registered for tonight's lecture. So I think we are all in good company. I'm going to quickly do a screen share so we can see some images uh, related to the history that I'll talk about this evening. Okay, I hope you can see that all right. It's a beautiful view of Old Jerusalem, and I hope that is a familiar view as well. Now this evening, we will take a look at the lives and stories behind many of the early church members who lived in the Holy Land, from Orson Hyde's arrival in 1841 to the end of the Palestine mission in 1934. There is a lot to cover. Now the historic images I'll show tonight, unless otherwise noted, are courtesy of the Community of Christ Archives. A great deal of gratitude is owed to Rachel Killebrew, the church archivist, and her dedicated staff who shared their knowledge, 
time with a scanner, and endless archival materials for this project. Before I launch into this church history, there's a couple of things to note. Much of what I will share with you comes from research for the 2019 church history tour that Peter mentioned earlier. Uh, this fine group of 50 traveled to many of the places that I'll talk about this evening. In fact, some of those guests I think are here with us tonight. Each day of the tour, we had a history class that explored the generations of Latter-day Saints who visited the Holy Land. So I'm going to do my best to condense those nine lectures down to a fun 45 minute lecture with all of you this evening. So hold on to your hats, friends. We have a lot to cover. Another very unfortunate part about this history is the majority of this lecture will focus on the American people who traveled as seekers and missionaries to Palestine in the 19th and early 20th century. I could find very little information related to those few church members who were native to the region. The Latter-day Saint message didn't take hold in the Holy Land. With few exceptions, most of our church history in the 19th and 20th century Palestine is a story about Americans living in a foreign land. It's a fascinating history, but I wanna be upfront in sharing that unlike the last two lectures we have heard about local church leaders and converts in India and Southeastern Nigeria working to build community of Christ in their native countries, tonight's history doesn't include that local involvement. It simply wasn't there. And for those who joined the church who were living in Jerusalem, I could find very little about their personal stories and experiences. The history of the church in the Holy Land is primarily about people from the outside learning to connect to cultures and customs of a foreign land. Throughout Community of Christ history, there has been a genuine fascination in the ancient lands of Palestine. In our first church newspaper, we included the words to a newly written hymn, Redeemer of Israel. Church members were encouraged to study the scriptures and to model their lives as the earliest Christians in the Book of Acts. Kirtland church members attended a Hebrew grammar class at the Kirtland Temple. Here you can see one of the books written by Joshua Satius, a Jewish scholar who led the Hebrew grammar course for the Kirtland Ohio Theological Institution, the church's first seminary. One of the books used in their studies included colored maps of the Holy Land. Here you can see an image of Joseph Smith Jr.'s personal copy. This book is on display in the museum at the Kirtland Temple Visitor Center. Uh, here's another image that comes from that book. And again, another map that the students in the 1830s would have seen uh, during that Hebrew grammar class. At the dedication of the Kirtland Temple on March 27th, 1836, Joseph Smith Jr. offered a prayer of dedication that included a passionate petition on behalf of Israel. And it was four years later, during a conference held in Nauvoo on April 6th, 1840, a motion was made and approved to send Orson Hyde to Palestine. By the end of the conference, John Page was called to accompany Hyde on the journey to Jerusalem. The missionary partners departed Nauvoo less than two weeks later. Hyde recalled beginning the journey with, quote, not the first dollar, neither two coats, nor a cane, nor an umbrella, end quote. Hyde and Page departed Nauvoo in 1840. Unfortunately, Page never made it out of the country. He was eventually replaced by George J. Adams, who departed New York with Orson Hyde on the ship United States, departing in February of 1841. <clears throat> the men arrived in Liverpool, England 18 days later. Church leaders in Britain asked Adams to remain in England while Hyde continued on to Jerusalem. Hyde made his way through Central Europe and then on to Constantinople and modern day Turkey. While planning for a four day sail to Lebanon, his ship was becalmed with little to no wind to move forward. It took 19 days to arrive on shore and that was 15 more days than he had originally planned. He ran out of food and resorted to eating snails to sustain his life. He said, quote, the greatest difficulty was I couldn't get enough of them. End quote. He eventually made it to Jaffa in October of 1841 and traveled by land to Jerusalem. Once in Jerusalem, Morrison climbed the Mount of Olives and offered a dedicatory prayer. He built a pile of stones as witness 
connecting to those in the Hebrew scriptures like Joshua and Samuel, it would take Orson over a year to return to his family in Nauvoo, arriving home on December 7, 1842, just in time for Christmas. Orson's trip to Palestine was one week shy of 32 months. Well, Orson's traveling companion from New York to Liverpool, G.J. Adams, regretted not continuing to Jerusalem with Orson Hyde. His dream of reaching Palestine would have to wait another 24 years. After a rocky relationship with Brigham Young and James Strang during the 1840s, Adams eventually started his own church, the Church of the Messiah, in 1861. Three years later, the group approved a conference resolution to begin a mission to the Holy Land. G.J. Adams traveled to Jerusalem and, like Orson Hyde before him, prepared a pile of stones on the Mount of Olives as a monument to the tribes of Israel. Adams returned to New England more motivated than ever about his community's calling to return to the Holy Land. And he was not alone. By August of 1866, a group of 157 passengers, including Adams' own family, boarded the Nellie Chapin and departed Jonesport, Maine, headed for the Holy Land. Here you see an artist's rendition of what that ship could have looked like, uh, courtesy of Gene Holmes. When the Nellie Chapin arrived on Jaffa's shores, they were met by the surprise that the Ottoman Empire had not given permission for the Americans to be there let alone by land and settle. The region was experiencing a cholera outbreak and there was hesitation about welcoming foreigners onto their land. Eventually, they were given permission <clears throat> to make a temporary home on the beach until they received clearance to purchase land. Some Americans were able to find refuge in hotels and the homes of friendly hosts, but most of the group settled on the beach in Jaffa like what you see here. You can see that they used window shutters and building materials brought over from Maine to create this makeshift tent city. Their beach residence was also next to the mass burial of nearly 200 cholera victims who died over the past year. A fellow resident described it as the exhalations through the porous sand from such a vast body of decomposition was very bad. The shore was the world's privy and butchers put their offal there. You can imagine the folks from Maine were used to fresh water from the streams and not as familiar with water sources in Jaffa. The polluted drinking water they obtained soon caused dysentery, first among the young and then the adults. Several children and adults died within the first few months of their arrival there at Jaffa. And as families began to settle in the Jaffa community, they built homes using the materials brought over from New England. Community members began farming the land and establishing businesses. However, their new life in this foreign environment was met with economic, social, and cultural challenges. Land was overpriced and difficult to purchase. Farming techniques and seasonal planning used in Maine were not effective in Jaffa. Sickness plagued the community, <clears throat> and parents were burying their children not long after their arrival. These issues, in addition to internal strife and Adam's poor decisions and personal struggles with alcoholism, caused the majority of his group to lose faith in his leadership and eventually return to the United States. However, some of their prefabricated homes, including a hotel built by John and George Drisco, still stands today in Jaffa. Here you can see a map drawn up by Reed Holmes showing the locations of the homes and businesses of that early community, a photo of the neighborhood, and the beautiful restoration work of one of those homes owned and restored by Reed and Jean Holmes, the Wentworth home. <clears throat> Today, the historic home is used as a private residence, a museum, <clears throat> excuse me, and an educational center today. Now, those who returned home to Maine eventually crossed paths with missionaries from the reorganization where you would think that after a trip to Palestine with G.J. Adams, one would be done with organized religion. The RLDS missionaries found rather a receptive audience within the former members of the Church of the Messiah. The views shared by the RLDS missionaries like T.W. Smith were very similar to the old restoration message preached by Orson Hyde and G.J. Adams. Families in Maine soon joined the reorganization, 
a number of congregations were planted and a few of G.J. Adams' followers became RLDS pastors and priesthood members. However, not all of Adams' followers returned to the United States. A few remained behind for a number of reasons. Some, like Rolla Floyd, who you see here, he saw an entrepreneurial opportunity in the Holy Land. Floyd quickly established himself as professional guide, offering tours of the Holy Land to visiting pilgrims. Members of the former colony helped pave a road to Jerusalem, and Rolla Floyd's main spring wagon was the first vehicle to roll down that new road. Floyd remained in the area for decades, hosting tours that included such high-profile guests as U.S. General Ulysses S. Grant and Kaiser Wilhelm. While some were excited about the business opportunities, others felt a spiritual calling to remain behind. Abigail Alley and her sister Anna Watts were two who stayed at Jaffa after the community dissolved in 1867. Anna had already buried a daughter, Elvira, a few months after arriving in Jaffa in November of 1866. Her husband returned home with their six-year-old son, John, while Anna remained behind in Palestine with two daughters, Sabrina and Ida May. Both her and her sister worked as hired hands for washing, ironing, paper hangings, all to help support their families. But death was very real for those who remained behind. Anna buried a second child in Jaffa, her daughter Sabrina, in 1869, and three months later, later Anna herself passed away. She was 39 years old. Her sister Abigail cared for Anna's daughter Ida for five years until Ida returned to Maine to be with her father. Abigail remained in Jaffa for nearly three decades. And Abigail's story is fascinating. She arrived at Jaffa with her husband Zebediah and their son Willie. Zebediah was able to get work building the road to Jerusalem, but once that job ended, he struggled to find additional work and he knew it would be much easier to find work back home in Maine. He was ready to return to the US. Unfortunately, he couldn't convince his wife to go with him. She said, quote, I've made my bed and will lie in it, end quote. Her six-year-old son, Willie, remind, uh, remained behind with her. Zebediah never returned to Palestine to see his wife or son. In fact, he remarried in 1869 and began a new family back home. But Abigail and Willie toughed it out in Palestine. She learned of the RLDS Church from her relatives back in Maine, who sent her copies of the Saints Herald. Abigail wrote her cousin, Susan Norton, in 1887 and talked about the need for church missionaries to be sent to Palestine. Susan sent the letter on to Lamoni and it was published in the Saints Herald. Abigail writes, quote, we are patiently waiting for an elder to come to this land. There are four of us who desire to be baptized, end quote. This letter set off a chain reaction among those in leadership. Soon, Abigail was in touch with Marietta Walker, editor of The Autumn Leaves, a church publication. Marietta invited Abigail to become a correspondent from the Holy Land and encouraged her to send in articles detailing her observations. What's helpful is that Marietta Walker introduced Abigail Alley to her readers, not with the usual harsh criticism that Abigail and others were used to hearing, when formally associated with the failed experiment in Jaffa. Marietta showed a sense of compassion towards those who suffered under Adams. Uh, Walker writes, as the readers of the Herald are aware, this colony went to Palestine. And although the movement was reported as an unfortunate one and generally looked upon as a failure, the letter of Sister Allie proves that it was not. It may be that so far as the intention which was in the mind of its leader was concerned, it was a failure. Man proposes, God disposes. And though what may have been proposed by man was not brought to pass, who is prepared to say that the purposes of God were, or ever have been, in any wise frustrated? Well, Abigail, Allie sent multiple letters to Marietta Walker, who published them in the autumn leaves as a column known as Leaves from Palestine. Those were published from 1887 through 1893. Abigail's letters were filled with observations and colorful impressions of life in the Holy Land. We learn from her column that her son Willie, like Rolla Floyd, becomes fluent in Arabic and skilled in folklore and interpreting the historic sites. 
He worked as a translator, guide, and chaperone for traveling groups. She also talks about the Holy Sepulchre around the time of the Easter feast, her son marrying a Catholic woman in 1888, and the birth of a granddaughter the following year. Abigail struggled to survive. She lived in poverty. Her home was robbed and life threatened. In one of her last letters to the Saints Herald in 1893, she thanks the bishop for sending her a bank check and shares that she has pawned her wedding ring and her son has sold the bedroom furniture to provide for the family's needs. Her letter ends with a final plea to send a missionary as she feels the church out ought to be represented in her community. She passed away the following year in 1894. She's likely buried in the same cemetery as her sister Anna Watts. Well, the impact of those who remained behind can't be understated. I mentioned Rolla Floyd became fairly successful with his stage and travel services, working first for Thomas Cook and then on his own until his death in 1911. Melville Ward and Willie Alley, Abigail's son, learned the tourist trade from Rolla Floyd. Herbert Clark and his brother became successful agents of Thomas Cook and Son in Jerusalem, where Herbert was in charge and built a still standing mansion on Mamilla Street and in Times Square in New York with his brother Frank. Herbert Clark also served as US Vice Counsel in Jerusalem for nearly 20 years around the turn of the century. The Clark and Floyd families remained close. When Rolla Floyd's wife Dosha passed away, he married Herbert and Frank Clark's younger sister, Mary Jane. Her son, Albert, would later adopt Rolla Floyd's name. Well, Rolla and Mary Jane Floyd were the bridge between the American colony and the RLDS church in Jerusalem. Mary Jane was baptized in the Jordan River by Apostle Gomer Griffiths during his 1910 visit. Rolla was accepted into the church on his original baptism. Unfortunately, he passed away the following year. The Floyd family owned a number of properties that were used by the church during this early 20th century. In Jaffa, their properties were used to house missionaries assigned to the region and was the site of a small RLDS branch for a short period. Their home in Jerusalem served as the center of the Palestine mission, a place to house missionaries, hold classes and weekly worship. I don't wanna give the impression this home in Jerusalem was a cottage. The Floyd house was described as a 20 room home, a stone house purchased and enlarged by Rolla and Mary Jane. Mary Jane Floyd also had connections within the local communities and it was important for church leaders in the US to continue good relations with her and her family. Mary Jane partnered with her son Albert in opening up Zion Hall in Jerusalem and according to Reed Holmes, it became the first motion picture theater in Jerusalem. The relationship between Mary Jane Floyd uh, the relationship she had with the church was similar to a family relationship. There was great appreciation, loyalty, and trust at times. But there was also strong emotions, frustrations, and anger at times, especially when Mary Jane felt taken advantage of by either church leaders or missionaries assigned to her area. There is no question in my mind, Mary Jane Floyd was the mother of the church in Palestine. Well, by 1906, Abigail Alley's hope for an RLDS missionary was realized when Paul M. Hansen arrived in Jerusalem in response to the many letters and missionary requests from those who remained behind. Hansen's visit to Jerusalem was brief and included limited contact with the remaining members of the Adams colony. Reed Holmes believed it was Paul Hansen who convinced church leaders to send a missionary to Palestine. In a joint council session on April 10th, 1910, Hugh Wellington Gould of Independence read them a letter from his father, George Gould, who lived then in Jerusalem. According to Gould, a number of people had been converted and desired someone to come and baptize them. In response, Apostle Gomer Griffiths, who was serving in England at the time, was instructed to go to Jerusalem. And Gomer arrives in Jerusalem on November 8th, 1910. A week later, Frederick G. Pitt and his wife, Rosa Parks Pitt, joined them. In fact, they are here having a, a picnic with Mary Jane Floyd. The Pitts plan to remain in Jerusalem for six months, then go on to their three-year assignment in Australia. One could say F.G. and Rosa were on their honeymoon as they were just married a few months before setting sail to uh, the Holy Land. <music> 
Historians have much to be grateful for when it comes to Rosa Parks Pitt. She documented much of their travel around the Holy Land in 1910. Photos were taken and later published along with her writings in the Autumn Leaves and later in the book Missionaries in the Bible Lands. A few days after their arrival, a group of 10 people traveled to the Jordan River where Gomer Griffiths and F.G. Pitt baptized four individuals. Florence Carr, a member of the Gould family, her husband Bertram, and their sons Harlbert and Paul. The following month, F.G. Pitt baptized two more people, Mary Jane Floyd and Michael Wellen, an Irish immigrant living in Jerusalem. Wellen, an elderly man, was also a renter at the Floyd House where the missionaries lived. And it's interesting that of the few who joined the church over the next two decades, a number of those converts were also renters in the Floyd's home during this period. The following year, 1911, F.G. Pitt reported to the Saints Herald, quote, we had to go to the Jordan again last week to baptize three more, a father and his two grown children, pure Arabs and good refined people, end quote. Reed Holmes was able to identify those being baptized by F.G. Pitt as Solomon Najim, who you see being baptized here, his daughter, Lulu, and his son, Aziz. The Najim or Najim family rented a place in the Floyd house and Solomon worked as a travel guide and interpreter for Rolla Floyd for years. Solomon would serve as a translator for a number of the missionaries traveling through uh, during their worship and classes. Griffiths officially organized a branch of 11 members during this time that included F.G. and Rosa Pitt, the Carr family, Rolla and Mary Jane Floyd, Michael Wellen, and the Najang family. You can see many of them featured here in this photo, which was taken a year later in 1912. Well, after serving a full year in Palestine, F.G. and Rosa Pitt departed for Australia. They traveled to Egypt and Tahiti as well, they represented the church at the 1915 Pan American World's Fair in San Francisco. They served in Tennessee for a while, and they even served as guides and as pastor of the Kirtland Temple Congregation during the summer seasons before they retired to Florida. Gomer Griffiths returned to England in January of 1911 and reported on the Palestine mission to the General Conference that spring, and he said, we can maintain our work in Jerusalem, providing we can keep an able minister and his wife there to look after and continue the work begun. But whoever is sent will have to be patient and long suffering as he will have to meet great opposition and persecution. The church will have to heartily support the mission with ample means. The mission will not be self-supporting for some time to come. Conditions in that country differ wildly from other parts of the world. Well, Reese and Hannah Jenkins would find Griffith's statement to be all too true. Their experience in Palestine is truly an incredible story, uh, one for a great Hollywood movie. It's filled with drama, betrayal, sadness, even a little comedy. They are featured here as the two individuals, second and third from the left, from my left. Hannah Sophia Edwards Jenkins and her husband Reese were both from Wales. Reese served as a branch president who spent time uh, street preaching. Perhaps caught up in the call to gather to the US, Reese and Hannah moved to the United States in 1898 and became US citizens in 1903. According to Hannah, it was UW Green, the tall man featured on the far right, who convinced Reese to join the mission field. Green was the elder in charge of the Ohio district, close to where the Jenkins were living. Reese traveled throughout the Southern Ohio uh, region with Arthur Kohler for one year. Arthur is standing next to Green in this photo. Reese was eventually ordained to the Office of 70 at the General Conference of 1908 and assigned to go back home to Wales. He was really enjoying his assignment in Leeds, England, and Hannah said they were somewhat loath to hear the news of his new appointment to Palestine in 1911. However, it wouldn't be long until Reese and Hannah were reunited with Arthur and Edna Kohler and UW Green in Palestine. There was a significant delay in Reese and Hannah departing Wales for Palestine. Long story short, they didn't have enough money from the World Church and ended up borrowing money from the bishop's agent in Leeds in order to pay for their passage to Palestine. Unfortunately, the delay cost them dearly as they missed meeting up with F.G. and Rosa Pitt before the Pitts departed for Australia. And according to Hannah, Hannah Jenkins, the locals didn't exactly roll out the red carpet for them. 
They first moved into Mary Jean Floyd's house, then began boarding with a newly baptized Carr family. Hannah said, quote, we found the few saints cold and indifferent, end quote. There were no meetings being held, so their first assignment was to gather the remaining church members to meet. They first began holding meetings in the Carr home, and Anna wrote, Jerusalem was a peculiar mission field, as we were not allowed to do any outdoor preaching, neither were we allowed to go from house to house tracking. Consequently, it was a very hard mission to labor in. Reese was much more optimistic in his writing to Gomer Griffiths. He talked about wanting to find a place to worship, starting a library and a school, and making it a profitable venture. His hopeful optimism began to take as they started a night school at the Floyd House. 45 students enrolled in English and math classes in 1912. Mary Jane Floyd and the Card family, Carr family departed for the U.S. the same year. Mary Jane went to Independence and later with her son and his family to Homestead in Montana. They named their ranch, I think it was called the Jerusalem Ranch, so Palestine was not far from her mind. While Mary Jane was away in Montana, Hannah Jenkins seemed to find her place as manager of the Floyd House in Jerusalem, which they soon began calling the Mission House. She rented rooms, led classes, and invited people to RLDS worship. With a variety of renters and guests coming through, Reese managed to pick up a little Arabic, Hebrew, and German. German was one of the European languages most frequently used in commerce there. At the 1913 General Conference, Ulysses W. Green was assigned the Palestine mission. Perhaps Reese Jenkins' optimism was contagious, as Green invited Arthur and Edna Kohler to join him on a two-year mission to Palestine. Like the Pitts, Arthur and Edna had only been married a few years before departing for Jerusalem. When Green and the Kohlers arrived in Jerusalem in September 1913, they found Reese and Hannah Jenkins leading two classes at the Mission House School. They also found regular worship services being held with Solomon Najim and Frederick Roos translating the services into Arabic and German. Translation was also happening on new tracks. Uh, and they were looking into uh, putting the Book of Mormon into Hebrew and Arabic translations. Hannah had really found her own calling in Palestine. A UW Green called her the matron of the home, indeed a mother in Israel. The Kohlers quickly jumped into the routine that Hannah and Reese put into place. Arthur and Edna taught classes in the evening while learning Arabic during the day. In October of 1913, Edna, wrote home to her father, Abner Holland, in New Bedford, Massachusetts, describing their weekly schedule in Jerusalem. She writes, Monday evening, I teach English to men, women, and children. Tuesday, we have religio study, classes in religion. Wednesday evening, prayer meeting. Thursday evening, and also Friday evening, I teach again. Saturday is free, and Sunday, we have our regular service. So you see my time is well occupied. Things seemed to be rolling along nicely for about a year. Then in October 1914, the Turkish army was mobilizing and the government reallocated food in Palestine, making supplies scarce for civilians. Only Turkey provided postal services. Foreign banks began to close or discount cash advances severely. Consular rights for foreigners were severely limited or suspended. When World War I began, citizens from nations like England, France, and Belgium were ordered out of Palestine, in some cases forcibly removed. Funds from church headquarters were even more scarce, and with limited postal services, there was a fear that the limited funds being sent to Palestine were not being received. That October, a telegram from Henry Morgenthau, then U.S. Ambassador, authorized the American consulate to give $500 to Green, the Kohlers, and the Jenkins family for their immediate return to the United States. Hannah remembered they were all called to the consulate, giving gold, given gold to cover their transportation expenses home. It's uncertain whether this was a loan or funds from the church via the government or part of a general distribution from the US government to citizens living in potential war zones. Unfortunately, it was not enough to bring all five American citizens home to the U.S. It was a heart-wrenching decision of who would stay and who would go. Hannah and Reese Jenkins volunteered to stay behind, while the Kohlers and UW Green returned home in November of 1914. 
Now, Green had assumed the Jenkins family would follow not long behind him. So before he left, he went to the U.S. consulate to make arrangements for Solomon Najime and his daughter Olinda to act as resident caretakers over the Mission House property. Hannah and Reese were not aware of this administrative action until they received a letter from Green as he was leaving Jaffa. He told them to leave the country as soon as possible and to let his orders be carried out. Well, that was easier said than done. Living in Palestine during a time of war was much more challenging than in times of peace. Postal services between Palestine and Missouri were either delayed or suspended from 1915 to 1917. Reese and Hannah were in desperate financial straits during this time. Reese's health was bad, and he was recovering from a severe typhoid attack, uh, attack during this time. Hannah was stretched thin, caring for him and caring for a widow named Mary Ann Brown, who was living with them in the mission house. Hannah managed the former Floyd house. She cleaned the guest rooms, supervised the cooking, and taught English classes. There was also the stressed relations between the Jenkins and the Najain families. Remember, Green placed Solomon in charge, assuming that Reese and Hannah were leaving town. With the Jenkinses unable to leave the region due to ill health and travel restrictions, they were assuming the leadership of the house. But Solomon took his new responsibilities from Green almost immediately upon his return from the consulate. So the tension was there between the Jenkins family and the Najain family, and accusations and threats surfaced between these two families. Hannah accused Solomon of diverting the rental income for his own personal use. She said that Solomon uh, went, or the Najain family members, went to the Turkish police and reported that Reese was an English spy, not an American, and that he was dabbling in local politics in July of 1916. Unfortunately, the only documentation we have on the subject is from Hannah's perspective and nothing from the Najain family, so you're not sure what to believe. Tensions did run high, though, and in 1917, the Turkish police arrested Reis, handcuffed him, and put him in jail, where he spent six nights uh, upon the cold stones. He was then taken to Damascus, Syria on December 1st, along with other British and, British and Americans. Well, during his six months of detention, he suffered from loneliness, illness, and lack of care, and lack of adequate food. A man named Reverend Archibald Forder, a prominent missionary for the Boston-based Christian Missionary Alliance, was taken prisoner in Jerusalem in 1914, and he served a prison sentence for an intercepted letter he wrote that contained less than flattering remarks about Turkey. He was held under house arrest at the time that Reese Jenkins arrived in Damascus. Forder rescued Reese from prison and gave him a room in his own quarters shared his food and nursed him during his illnesses. Meanwhile, church funds finally reached Hannah in Jerusalem in April, thanks to the Syrian Palestine Relief Committee in Cairo. Hannah was hopeful she would be reunited with her husband soon. Unfortunately, that day would never come. The following month, Reese fell ill with typhus and was moved by the Turks to a hospital about two miles out of the city. He died there on May 9th, 1918. His body was sent off with others to be buried. The next day, Reverend Forder found Reese's body thrown in a mass grave with other corpses and left to decompose. With a group of helpers, Forder recovered Jenkins' body, had a coffin made, and buried Reese's remains in the Protestant cemetery there in Damascus. While well, Hannah's brother in Ohio was the first to receive word of Reese's passing in July of 1918 in a telegram from the State Department. Church President F.M. Smith learned by telegram on August 3rd from the Secretary of State, Frank Polk. But it wasn't until August 4th, three months after her husband's death, that Hannah learns the news from the military governor of Jerusalem. She wrote to UW Green a few weeks later. She was devastated. Hannah was now a widow with no priesthood authority, isolated from family and church headquarters, and enmeshed in a struggle for survival and serving as the only semi-official World Church representative during World War I in Jerusalem. She arranged to sublet part of the mission house to the American Friends Mission of Ramallah. Hannah reserved three rooms for her own use and assigned the other rooms for students, and some suspect she evicted the Najain family or at least tried to. Remember Solomon, who was left in charge? 
The British Army charged his son Aziz with selling liquor illegally to British shoulder, soldiers and entertaining them in the mission house. The rental agreements were seriously complicated as they didn't technically own the house. Mary Jane Floyd, who was out of the country, owned the house. So letters went back and forth from the US consulate to the presiding bishop and UW Green. Green assumed Solomon was in charge of the mission house, uh, original to his agreement from 1914. Hannah disagreed. Well, on a side note, very little is known about Solomon Najaim until recently. In 2014, a collection of papers were found on eBay by a professor in the UK. Uh, this scrapbook of papers included the cover words, Testimonial Book of Jagamond Solomon Najima. This is the same Solomon who joined the church and lived in the Floyd House. This collection of letters are mostly from his time as a traveling guide and interpreter. There are a few letters from Green and the Kohlers sent from the US after they departed Palestine in 1914. And the letters that were sent from Maine and Massachusetts show this genuine affection and respect among these church members. It's clear that Edna and Olinda Najaim were close friends. They talked about the Kohlers returning to Palestine and the possibility of the Najaim family immigrating to the US. Whether or not Hannah knew of this intimate relationship is not clear. It's also not clear how long the Najaim family stayed at the Floyd House throughout the 1920s. The next time they appear in the letter book is in 1933 when Solomon passes. What's interesting is many of the Najaim family members soon immigrate to the United States. Job Najaim, Solomon's son, attends Graceland and Kansas State Teachers College. Here you can see him in a traveling men's glee club for the Kansas State Teachers College. Job is the one appearing in the second row far right. Job later leaves Pittsburgh, Kansas, joins the army and serves in World War II. He later worked as an artisan at Old Sturbridge Village and opened his own artist studio called The Potter's Wheel on Cape Cod. An interesting um, part of this is Solomon and UW Green traveled to Lebanon at some point to meet with Solomon's extended family. There Green met Solomon's nephew, George Najaim. And years later, Dan Sordin, a missionary serving in the Palestine mission, would make a follow-up visit with George in Lebanon. You can see them here in this photo. George moved to Jerusalem, lived in the mission house, and worked in the British post office in Jerusalem for a short period of time before immigrating to the United States to attend Graceland. Uh, he is the one on the far right. He later became an appointee and president of 70 for the RLDS Community of Christ. Many of you may have known him. He passed away in 2000. Uh, fortunately for historians, Arthur and Edna Kohler save many of their letters from Palestine, uh, and they, the, the family members, the descendants, uh, donated these letters to the uh, World Church Archives. Uh, they've been tr transcribed and published in a great book that was annotated by Carol Freeman Brady called Letters from Jerusalem, 1913 to 1914. But let's get back to Hannah Jenkins. She finally returns to the US to family in Ohio in 1920. She remained in Ohio until she passed away 34 years later. Like Rosa Parks Pitt, Hannah Jenkins carefully documents her history uh, during her time in Palestine. And she authored two biographies of her husband, Reese. She considered him a martyr. Well, after she departs Jerusalem, President F.M. Smith arrives for a visit to the Holy Land and during his time in the region, he met with Reverend Archibald Boulder, uh, the Good Samaritan that helped Reese Jenkins during his time of need. Smith also directed Harry Passman, the new missionary assigned to the Palestine mission, to erect a tombstone for Reese Jenkins in the Protestant cemetery. So during this time, Mary Jane Floyd returns to Jerusalem from her time in the United States. If you recall, it was her home that was being referred to as the mission house. This change in title added confusion as to who owned the structure, Mary Jane or the RLDS Church. The missionaries were treating it as church property. When Mary Jane returned to Jerusalem, she found her home in an altered state. Furniture was damaged or destroyed, and her relationship with those she trusted to care for her property was left in tatters. She was angry. Apparently, Hannah Jenkins, thinking the furniture in the home was church property, burned the furniture for warmth, for firewood, during a cold winter season. Mary Jane was furious, and she fired off a letter to Henry pa Harry Passman 
the new appointed missionary on his way to Jerusalem, demanding he pay past rent, claiming the church had failed to pay her rent for several months. By the time Harry and Lil Passman arrived in Jerusalem in 1920, she was demanding at least one year's past rent from the church. As you can imagine, it was quite the, the first impression, quite the welcome mat for the new missionary couple in town. Mary Jane and Harry Passman both had strong personalities and I don't think they ever got along. The Passmans followed orders from headquarters and continued renting from Mary Jane despite the hard feelings. And there were hard feelings. Harry wrote to James Kerr, his old friend from Illinois and now a bishop in Independence. He writes, I am renting from Sister Floyd, but she says she is renting them cheap and will demand more money for them after September 15th. If there is a person on earth that has more unadulterated gall than Sister Floyd, I haven't seen her yet. All she expects from the church is enough money to live on. The missionary to make the repairs on the building and do the decorating, and the missionary's wife to be her hired girl and nurse. And she would appreciate it very much if the church could furnish her an errand boy. Beside from this, she is perfectly satisfied. Well, Harry was not a seasoned missionary in the church. He was a businessman in the Chicago area, and he agreed to leave his position for three years to support the church in Palestine. Arriving in the Holy Land included an incredible amount of culture shock for the Passmans. Conditions in Jerusalem were nothing like what they left behind in Chicago. He described his living situation in a letter to Bishop Kerr. He writes, the front rooms marked synagogue are occupied by a Jewish family of about eight persons. They sing their prayers out loud just as the same as in a synagogue. The English family have a dog that barks the greatest part of the time. Behind us is a family with a phonograph and they have the same, and they have some Turkish records. One of these records sounds like a cat dying and the other record sounds like two cats dying. When the synagogue is in full swing in the front and the dog barking on the left and the phonograph running in the rear, it's enough to drive a man insane. I never worked under more discouraging conditions in all my life. In addition to the above, this land is blessed with fleas, flies that stick to you like glue, bed bugs, and an animal that resembles a lizard. These vary in size from two inches long to six inches. They run up the sides of the houses. So you can see we have everything to make our happiness complete. In the midst of the sarcasm in this letter, you can also witness the privileged lifestyle Harry and Lil were accustomed to in Illinois. Not only are they dealing with culture shock and quarrels with Mary Jane Floyd, by 1921, they were soon post hosting the church president and an apostle of all people. President F.M. Smith and Apostle T.W. Williams visited Palestine in the spring of 1921 and quickly discovered the needs of the Palestine mission. This trip was a part of President Smith's 18-month international trip to see the church outside of North America. F.M. Smith surely witnessed the tension between Mary Jane Floyd and the missionaries. One incident comes to mind. Mary Jane discovered a clothesline someone had installed on her house in a way that could damage the structure. Reed Holmes suspected it was F.M. Smith's heavy pants that were hanging on the line and weighing the pull of the line on the side of the house. Whatever the cause, Mary Jane was irritated and cut the clothesline down, but it didn't end there. She assumed the culprit was the Passmans and began yelling at them to, quote, get out of the house, you devils. When Harry Passman came upon the scene, he said that Mary Jane flat out, quote, walloped me on the jaw, end quote. And in turn, Harry's reaction was to take a swing at Mary Jane. It was a devastating scene considering the long history of the Floyds in the Holy Land and the church they had so much hope in. In addition, President Smith soon discovered the issue of bed bugs and the cost of eradicating them. This image taken at the time appears as though the four are playing cards and enjoying themselves immensely. I was surprised to learn that this image is actually showing them picking bed bugs out of their linens and clothes. Um, bed bugs were a, a considerable issue uh, in Jerusalem during this time, and Harry Passman ordered hundreds of boxes of soap, literally thousands of bars of soap, to combat the issue. They also worked at selling the soap to others within the community. And not surprising, F.M. Smith soon lit the green light for the church to build its own mission house there in Jerusalem. The Passmans located a piece of property not far from the Floyd House, 
Harry was able to get the approvals needed from 1921 through 23, and he focused on the construction of this beautiful stone building. It was about 100 feet wide and 400 feet long, cost the church about 15,000 to build. And the mission house bustled with activity. Um, the past men's were distracted most of the time with that, which gave uh, Harry and Mary Jane the space that they needed um, during this time. There may have been rough times with Harry, but Mary Jane was just as committed to staying in the church, whether the congregational activities were happening in her home or the mission house. And she appears over and over in missionary photos throughout the 1920s and 30s. And also keep in mind, these folks are living world history in Jerusalem. They were there during the time of the Balfour Declaration, uh, which was giving a homeland to the Jews. But sadly, Harry's wife, Lil, never could adjust to life in Palestine. Uh, she had health setbacks like ma malaria and other illnesses. And eventually they uh, needed to travel home, but they were replaced by Daniel and Gladys Sorden. Daniel and Gladys were both talented teachers by profession. Dan had come to the Holy Land from England where he was sent to set up a leadership school. However, the family story goes that Dan didn't want to travel to England alone. He sent a telegram to Gladys Steele, who was teaching in El Paso, Texas at the time. They'd grown up together in Oklahoma and were soon married. Dan baptized Gladys in Brooklyn before they departed for the British Isles. Their daughter, Marilyn, was born not too long after. And in 1923, they were scheduled to return to the US just before their departure. Um, just before their departure, they were sitting in a worship service at the Enfield congregation, and a man rose to speak and said to Dan, quote, before you see your homeland, you will preach to a people whose tongue you do not know, end quote. The very next day, a telegram came from Independence that said, quote, wait, considering other possibilities, return tickets, end quote. Well, the Sordans arrived in Jerusalem, moved into the mission house, soon began leading classes at the school and uh, worship within the congregation. Where the Passman's um, big legacy was building the mission house for Dan and, um, for Dan and uh, Gladys, uh, it seems like their legacy was designing the garden that you see here, um, building this beautiful garden and working on the landscape of the uh, mission house. Uh, the locals in the area nicknamed the mission house the flower of the neighborhood probably because of this beautiful garden. Their daughter Marilyn has memories of the mission house. You can see her in a photo on the balcony. Um, she remembered seeing in school, both Jew Jewish and Arab children. She remembered playing with them. Um, she remembered baths in a galvanized tub in a spare room, used also as her mother's sew sewing room in the mission house. She remembered geraniums on the front balcony and all sorts of detailed memories. Well, the Sorden family eventually departed the Holy Land in 1926, and it wasn't an easy departure. They literally had a shipwreck near the Isle of Patmos on the way. The ship rammed a large rock, which punctured the vessel, and at the same time, kept water out until all could be rescued. Well, the Joint Council soon appointed Homer and Maud Doty to replace the Sordens. The Doty family arrived in 1927 and stayed for two years. Uh, they also brought their daughter Maud, along with them, and you could see her here. Upon their departure, Homo Dodi made arrangements to rent out the mission house uh, before they left Palestine two years later. And on a side note, Homer Dodi's missionary trunk, which you see here, um, was donated to the church archives along with a collection of photo albums from their time in the Holy Land. Uh, just last year, this was donated, and there was a great jubilation when this gift of church history arrived. The items were preserved by descendants of the Doty family through the generations. And it's a great example of how our personal history is church history. Well, the 1930s were not an easy period for the church financially. By 1934, the R RLDS church was needing to pay for the construction of the auditorium and they needed cash to continue the work of the church. The Great Depression hit the church hard and the presiding bishopric was looking to liquidate available assets. Property in Jerusalem, an area where the church struggled to establish a self-sustaining mission, let alone a congregation, seemed like a logical place to sell, to, to close up shop. Church leaders like Albert A. Smith and Bishop L. F. P. Curry supported the sale of the mission house. However, there were also strong voices in opposition to the sale. People like President F. M. Smith, 
Paul Hansen, UW Green, and Gomer Griffiths, people who had actually been to Palestine and witnessed the region. Where Harry Passman and Mary Jane Floyd couldn't agree on anything during the 1920s, they found themselves united for once, united against the sale of the Jerusalem property, and they both wrote strongly worded letters to church leadership, encouraging them to keep the Jerusalem property. And I see I'm running um, late on time, so I'm gonna cut this short. Despite the opposition, the church elected to sell the mission house and the land. The sale took place in 1934, the same year Mary Jane Floyd passed away. The sale of the property and buildings totaled $13,000. It was the close of a long chapter in church history. Now the mission house still stands today. <coughs> Excuse me, this is a more modern view of it. Here you can see Reed and Jean Holmes giving us a church history tour of the area in 2009, pointing out details of that mission house, like the arched windows and doors uh, still in, intact. It wouldn't be until decades later that the World Church would once again turn their eyes to the Holy Land. Individual church members um, would relocate to Israel, like uh, Jean and Reed. Graceland College and Park University offered credits to students studying in Israel. Winter term was offered for Graceland students. And an apostolic team consisting of Eugene Austin, Lloyd Hirschman, and Paul Booth visited Israel in 1981 to do a survey of the possibilities of the church returning to the Holy Land. Uh, they returned home energized and optimistic. Uh, they didn't want to move quickly. The emphasis was placed on getting to know the people and culture, building relationships before constructing buildings. Here you can see a picture of Wayne Ham um, being there during this exploratory time as well. Unfortunately, um, with Section 156, uh, with the emphasis on building the Temple and Independence, a lot of the momentum about uh, going to Israel and the church having a footprint there, um, it just stopped um, for, for many church leaders, even though they were fully a registered legal entity in Israel in 1983. Um, for many of the church leaders, they were in retrenchment mode, uh, not wanting to, to go any further, wanting to get a handle on the impact of the ordination of women and constructing uh, of the temple. They were playing it conservative. Um, so that was a very fast, and much longer than I had anticipated. Thank you all for hanging in there with me. So thank you, Barb, for sharing with us tonight. Um, also, thank you to Megan for helping co-host this evening and for managing everything from behind the scenes. And thank you so much uh, to Jean for being with us tonight. It was, uh, we were very blessed to have you join us. What a gift. Lastly, we share our thanks to you, our friends in the audience, for joining us this evening and for generously supporting the Community of Christ Historic Sites uh, with your donations. Thank you so much for your support. Now I encourage you to tune in next week as we explore the story behind Community of Christ in the British Isles with Andrew Bolton. Megan is dropping or has already dropped a link to that autumn lecture series in the chat box. So follow that link to register for next week's program. It's an evening you don't want to miss. So until next Thursday, take care, everyone. Keep reading your church history and have a good night.